Okay, so here's the first video on uh, reviewing for the final. Um, so I'm going to start with stuff out of chapter two, which was about limits. And so, yeah, the, the main skill is to just find a bunch of limits. Um, there's not too much else that's going to come out of this chapter. So, yeah, let's just start looking at one. Um, so how about this one? Limit as x goes to 2 of this. Uh, what should I try first? I should try plugging in x equals 2. What do I get? I get 4 plus 6 minus 10 over 4 minus 2 minus 2. So I've got 0 over 0. So this means that we have something interesting that we don't know the answer yet. We're going to have to do some more work. So back in back in the day when we were doing chapter 2, when we barely knew anything about limits, here's how we did it. And, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. You factor. You try to factor it and then hope that something cancels. And it's always a good bet that if, if x is going to 2, it's a good bet that I'm going to see an x minus 2 on the top and the bottom, and that's going to be exactly what cancels. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I, so I've made this guess that I'm going to have a factor of x minus 2 on the top and the bottom. And let me try to fit that together with everything. So on the top, I'm thinking of two numbers that would add up to 3 and multiply out to negative 10. I see that 5 and negative 2 would do that. So my, my little guess that I made here is confirmed now because this factors into x plus 5 and x minus 2. But it's easier because I made that guess ahead of time. Um, on the bottom, it looks like I'm going to have x plus 1 times x minus 2. Okay, so we're in business here. This cancels. Now I discover that I can plug in x equals 2, so I get 7 thirds. And that's the answer. Um, so why, why was I talking about, like, th this is the old way of doing it? Because we have a new way of doing it. Uh, L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule works when you get 0 over 0. So what I could have done is once I realized I'm getting 0 over 0, I use L'Hopital's rule. So this turns into the limit as x goes to 2 of 2x plus 3 over 2x minus 1. And then I plug in x equals 2, and sure enough, I get 7 thirds again. So... And, and I want you to know that I don't care how you do it. Uh, either way is fine with me. Um, one thing, I mean, if I could give you a piece of advice, I would do it the second way. The, and, and that's just a matter of opinion, but um, hear me out. So I, I, I find that once you know L'Hopital's rule, you can kind of forget a lot of the old limit tricks because L'Hopital's rule takes care of a lot of them with, without having to remember all, all of these uh, peculiar, specific um, algebra tricks that we had to do um, when we were first in this class. In the first several weeks, we learned these these weird tricks that, that we needed, but you'll discover that once you know L'Hopital's rule, you no longer need many of those. Um, I don't want to say you can completely forget all of them, but it's, it's nice to know L'Hopital's rule. So let's look at this square root one. Um, so what do we always try first? We try plugging in the value of x. 
I get square root of 5 minus square root of 5 over 0. So that's 0 over 0. So here I am again. Um, now let me give you a similar speech, not as long this time. Um, back in the day, when we were first learning limits, what would we do? We would do the conjugate trick, which the, the conjugate trick is, it's on the, our list of algebra tricks that we can do sometimes if we're trying to figure out a tricky limit. Um, so one thing I could do is do the conjugate trick. So I would, just a review, I would multiply the top and the bottom by something that looks like this, except it how it has a plus sign in, in between. Um, and you should know how to do that still. But let's not do that. Let's do L'Hopital's rule because we can. Easy part first. Derivative of the bottom is just 1. Now let's talk about the derivative of the top. Of course, these square roots are really 1 half powers, so I can take care of this with the chain rule. So it's like, um, I, I'm not going to bother rewriting it, but just use your imagination. It's like this to the 1 half power. So the derivative would be, I bring the 1 half down, and then I would have this to the negative one half power. And I would multiply that by the derivative of the inside because I'm doing the chain rule. Minus, okay, similar here. One half times this to the negative one half times the derivative of the inside for this is 2. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we try to plug in x equals 3 again and see if this works any better for us. So I would get 1 half times 5 to the negative 1 half minus, I guess this 1 half and the 2 can cancel. And I, so I get 5 to the minus 1 half. And let's just simplify that. Uh, this is like 1 half times 1 over the square root of 5. Minus 1 over the square root of 5. And yeah, why don't I... I, won't, I don't want this to take forever. Whoops. I can factor out 1 over the square root of 5, and I get a half minus 1, and that's a minus a half. So this is like minus a half times 1 over root 5. So that's what I get. Okay. I don't want you to forget about conjugates, but... I also don't want you to feel like you have to use conjugates if you really don't. Um, sometimes, con I mean, you, you really can't all completely forget about conjugates. Sometimes you'll really need them. But there are situations when in the past we would have used conjugates when now we no longer need to. So I encourage you to think about using L'Hopital's rule if you, um, if you can. All right, let's do something else. This one. What do we always do first? We plug in x. What am I going to get? I get 4 plus 4 over 0. All right, so now I'm in an interesting situation. Um, I didn't get 0 over 0. I got something else over 0. So... If you remember, and maybe this is a good time for me to remind you, if you get something like this, meaning you get zero on the bottom and you don't get zero on the top, there's only three possibilities for how this could go. The limit could not exist, it could be positive infinity, or it could be negative infinity. 
It's definitely going to be one of these. What this comes down to is whether this is, uh, roughly speaking, whether it's like a positive zero or a negative zero. And yeah, so, so what, I, what I just said, strictly speaking, doesn't make sense. But what I mean by a positive zero is I mean something that's going to zero but that's always positive. And by, if, when I say negative zero, I mean something that's going to zero but is always negative. There's the other possibility, which is that you could have something that, that's going to zero and it's sometimes positive and other times negative. Um, and, but the way that behaves is going to determine which one of these three answers it is. So we just have to think about it. Um, and so I look at the particular thing that I'm dealing with and I notice that x is going to 2 from the right. Often on these you will have a specific direction and that will help you figure out which one of these answers it is. Um, in this case x is going to 2 from the right. And on the bottom what I have is a 2 minus x. So... If x is a little bit bigger than 2, that, that's what I'm supposed to imagine. If x is going to 2 from the right, I imagine that x is a tiny bit bigger than 2. What I'm going to have here is a small negative number, right? If x is a little bit bigger than 2, then 2 minus x would be less than 0. It would be a negative number. Um, and that tells us our answer. So basically, um, I'm taking a number that on the top is approaching positive 8, and on the bottom it's approaching 0, but it's always negative. And if I take a number that's very close to 8, and I divide it by a number that's very close to 0 and negative, what I'm going to get is a negative answer. Um, in particular, this is negative infinity. And just, just to explain the whole situation, if the bottom was always positive, then I would have positive 8 over a small positive number, and I would say the answer is positive infinity. If the bottom was sometimes positive, sometimes negative, then I would say it doesn't exist because the, the answer could be positive infinity or negative infinity and we can't tell which one uh, or, or it, it could be different answers from different sides and we say we say such things do not exist but in the, you know as it turned out the bottom was negative and that's why the answer is negative infinity all right <clears throat> so let's look at another one e to the x minus x squared, as x goes to infinity. Um, and what we have here, I mean, well, okay, so what do we always try to do first? We try to plug in x, but infinity isn't really a number, it's a symbol, and, and it's, it's, you can't exactly plug in infinity, so we can't really plug in anything first. We have to imagine what happens. Um, my eyes are drawn to this exponent here. If I could figure out what happens with that, maybe I can figure out what happens with the whole thing. So as x goes to infinity, I'm thinking, what happens with x minus x squared? But I get a little bit confused because if I break this apart further and just imagine what's happening to the x, of course the x is going to infinity, and x squared would also be going to infinity, right? If I, x is going to infinity, so x squared is going to infinity. And then what I see is that I'm taking like something that's going to infinity and I'm subtracting something that else, something else that goes to infinity. And that's, that's an indeterminate form. Um, It's, it's not so easy to say what happens with infinity minus infinity. It, it depends which one's bigger, so to speak. Um, so we're going to have to do something, but before I give too long of a speech of how hard this is, let me point out it's not really that hard. I'm just, 
I want to make sure we all understand why I'm about to do what I'm about to do. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor x squared out. Basically, I, I, my advice is to just pull out the highest power of x. And then what do I get? I have 1 over x minus 1. And now it's a lot easier to look at this and tell what's happening. If I focus on the exponent again, um, let me pick this apart. So x is going to, inf to infinity, so x squared is going to infinity. Now let's look at what's in parentheses. Um, this part would be going to zero, right, because x is going to infinity. So the thing in parentheses is just going to negative one. So what I see in here is I see something that's going to infinity times something that goes to negative one. So I would say that, that what's going on in the exponent goes to negative infinity because this is going to positive infinity and this is going to negative one. Um, and now I have a question of <clears throat> what happens if I do e to a power and the power is going to negative infinity? For that, maybe it's helpful to remind you of the graph of e to the x. Specifically, the part of the graph as you move farther and farther to the left, because that's like um, e to the negative infinity. Roughly speaking, what I'm wondering right now is what happens if you do e to the negative infinity or e to a power that's going to negative infinity? And the answer is in this graph, if you just look farther and farther to the left, it, it has this horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So this is zero. If you have e to a power that's going to negative infinity, that goes to zero. All right. What else can there be in this chapter? <clears throat> um, we can have piecewise functions. And th these are their own type of thing. Um, you just have to remember to know w what to do with these. Uh, <clears throat> you'll have a piecewise function, and typically you'll be asked whether it's continuous at a particular value of x. And typically that value of x is going to be like the transition point between like when you have one uh, formula versus when you have the other formula. Like, more specifically, this is a piecewise function that follows one formula for all values of x less than or equal to 1 and another formula for values of x greater than 1, and we're being asked about the value 1, which is like the transition point between these two things. And that, that's a very typical situation. Uh, the way you go about this and the way you the way you determine your answer and justify your answer is you want to find the left limit and the right limit. So the limit as x goes to 1 from the left of f of x. If x is going to 1 from the left, x is a, we're imagining that x is a number that is less than 1. So I use this formula. And now that I use this formula, this is, a, this is a very easy limit. I can just plug in x equals 1. So I get 2 minus 1, so that's 1. The limit as x goes to 1 from the right, I'm imagining that x is a number larger than 1, so I use this, and I plug, now that I have this, this is a very easy limit to find. I just plug in 1, and I get 1. So let me be a bit pedantic here. Um, 
this has this has passed one of the tests that the left limit and the right limit were equal. This allows us to conclude that the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is 1, now that I'm, I'm not specifying from the right or from the left, because the, the right and the left agree. Um, this does not technically mean that, that f is continuous. There's one other thing to check, which is the actual function value. In order to be continuous, the limit has to exist and it has to match the function value. So there's one last thing to check, but this is going to be easy. f of 1 is just, I'll follow this rule because this is the rule for x less than or equal to 1. And this feels like work that we've already done, but it's, it's necessary to do. Well, I get 1. So sure enough, the limit exists because the right and left limit exist and they both match. Um, the limit was 1, and the function value was also 1. Everything matches up. It's 1, 1, 1, 1. So, so yes, the, the function is continuous at x equals 1. Um, okay. So, what next? Let's do... One like this, and so I'm going to give us a familiar speech here, which is that we have an old way of doing this. I, I gave you a rule that says if you have a polynomial over another polynomial and x is going to infinity or negative infinity, then all that matters is the leading term on the top and the leading term on the bottom. But since we know L'Hopital's rule, and since as x is going to infinity, the top would be going to infinity, and the bottom would also be going to infinity. So this is an infinity over infinity form. And we know L'Hopital's rule. Why not use it? So I get 6x squared plus 2 over 15x squared plus 3. And what's happening now? Well, actually, x is going to infinity, so then it looks like the top is going to infinity and the bottom is still going to infinity. Well, the good thing about L'Hopital's rule is you can do it again and again, and often, Often, uh, you need to do it several times. Uh, so now I'm down to this, 12x over 30x. Um, and x is going to infinity, so, well, it looks like the top is going to infinity and the bottom is going to infinity. Um, I'm being a little bit silly, of course, because the, the more obvious thing to do is to just cancel an x. If I just cancel an x, then, then the top and the bottom aren't going to infinity anymore. It's just 12 over 30. Um, and yeah, maybe not, not to confuse anybody, but the other thing I could have done is instead of canceling the x's, is I could have done L'Hopital's rule a third time. Um, of course, the derivative of 12x is just 12, and the derivative of 30x is just 30, so using L'Hopital's rule would have had the exact same result. Um, Either way you cut it, I get 12 over 30, which is, yeah, that's 6 over 15. Oh, wait, you can cancel more than that. Uh, Two-fifths. There we go. Uh, yeah, I should have known the answer was two-fifths. <laughs> if, if I had to use my brain, I would have known the answer would have, was supposed to be two-fifths here. Anyway... Let's do one more, this one. Um, so let's pick it apart. Again, x is going to infinity, so we can't plug in infinity. We have to use our imagination. Um, 
So as x is going to infinity, x squared goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, and if I'm doing the square, the square root of something going to infinity would also go to infinity. So it looks like this part is going to infinity, and x is also going to infinity. So it looks like what we have here is another infinity minus infinity indeterminate form. Um, <clears throat> and this is why, this is one example for why I told you that you should not just forget about the conjugate trick. Um, I'm going to use the conjugate trick here. There's no obvious way for me to use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule is for fractions, where you have a top and a bottom, and we don't have one. Um, so what I do is I just make this a fraction by putting it over 1, and then I'm going to do the conjugate. Okay, so what do I have here? Um, remember that this is just like, uh, when I multiply this, I just get the first thing squared minus the second thing squared. So the first thing squared, that just makes the square root disappear. So the square root has just disappeared now. The second thing squared is x squared. Right, so that's that times that, and on the bottom I just have one times this, so I'll just copy this down. Like that. <clears throat> okay, now I wanna clean things up. There's one obvious thing to do, which is to cancel the x squared, so I see two x over x squared plus 2x plus x. Okay, where are we now? Um, now I've reached a point where um, what I should do is to try, well, okay, I can't plug in infinity, but I have to use my imagination and, and imagine what, can I just look at this and tell what happens as x goes to infinity? Um, well, the top is going to infinity, and on the bottom, uh, this is going to infinity, because this is like infinity plus infinity, and the square root of something that goes to infinity is also going to infinity. And on the bottom, I'm adding infinity, and if I have infinity plus infinity, that goes to infinity. So, let me summarize. We said the top is going to infinity and the bottom is going to infinity. So I would describe this as an infinity over infinity form. Okay, so what would we do in the past? In the past, we did an algebra trick that involved factoring something out of the square root. Um, and I am... I think what I'm going to do is, is not that now. I just want to remind you that this is, this is something that we can do. I would factor an x squared, and, and if I factor an x squared, then when it comes out of the square root, it becomes just an x. Um, but let's use L'Hopital's rule instead, because we can. Because this is an that's an infinity over infinity indeterminate form, which is something that L'Hopital's rule applies to. So the derivative of the top is just two. The derivative of the bottom. Okay, we need a little chain rule here. So 
I'm going to have something that looks like this because this is a one half power, right? And and let me fill in the blanks here. This is the same inside. And then, oops, how do I? Okay. Um, sorry about that. I was in the middle of taking the derivative of this, and. I was using the chain rule, and I still needed to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x plus 2. Oh no, am I getting myself in trouble? That would be unfortunate, because I made it through almost this whole video without significant problems. Yeah, um, maybe let me abandon this method right now. I don't like where this is going. Um, but maybe, maybe this is, so there, there's a good moral to this story. Maybe the moral is that you really can't forget the old tricks. Because I'm trying to use Lopi Tau's rule here, and I, I really don't like the looks of this. Yeah. Let me, okay. But that's all right. Sometimes in math and in life, you try things that don't work, and then you realize that it's not working, and you try something else. Let's do the first idea that, that I mentioned, the, the old school idea. Um, <clears throat> we're going to factor something out of the square root. So I'm just going to pick up from here. So, right, if you recall, the, the rule that I'm using here is this rule, like if a is a number that's greater than or equal to zero, then this is like if I have an a squared underneath the square root, I can pull it out and it becomes an a on the outside of the square root. So let me, maybe I'll show plenty of work here. Because what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm factoring x squared out of this. Because I know that an x squared on the inside is going to become an x on the outside. And then what I can do is I can cancel an x from the top. Well, and the bottom, of course. So this becomes just a 2, this x goes away, and this x becomes a 1. And, oh, am I still, is this still going to give me trouble? No, actually. Um... Whoops, okay, yeah. This was a plus, right? I just copied that down wrong. This was a plus, so this was a plus. Okay, there we go. Um, now I think I'm gonna be good. Let me, because I made kind of a mess. The top is just two and the bottom is this plus this. Okay, and before I get myself into even more trouble this video, x is going to infinity, that means this is going to zero. On the top, I've just got two. On the bottom, I've got square root of one plus one, so that's two over two, so I just get one. Okay, good. <laughs> 